Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala sayyidina wa azimina Wa habib qulubina wa shafi'ina Abil Qasim Muhammad وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين إذا فعلوا فاحشة أو ظلموا أنفسهم ذكروا الله فاستغفروا لذنوبهم ومن يغفر الذنوب إلا الله ولم يصروا على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون. The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. اللهم صل. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The verse in question, verse 135 of chapter 3 of the Holy Quran is one of the most understudied and undervalued verses within the Qur'an and indeed has one of the most striking reasons for revelation which you will find of any of the verses in the Qur'an and indeed the substance of its reason for revelation is seen as being somewhat controversial in its content you find that this verse has to be examined in depth it is translated in the English language with the following those who commit an indecency or are unjust to themselves they then remember Allah and ask for forgiveness who is there to forgive their sin except Allah on the point that they are not persistent in that sin again you find that this verse relates to the topic of the importance of the act of repentance in the life of the human being we find that each and every religion in the world today espouses the importance of repentance. As in if you go to the religion of Christianity or the religion of Judaism or indeed the religion of Islam, you'll find that in many instances the plethora of the narratives that we have with us discuss the fact that any human being can repent at any time that the doors of God's mercy are open for any human being as an irrespective of whatever sin you've committed in your life in this world the door of repentance never closes for anybody be it a repentance in the final year of your life or in the final month of your life or in the final week of your life or in the final day of your life or even in the final minute of your life if the repentance is a sincere repentance then you find each of these religions saying Allah or the Lord 
is so merciful that his door of repentance never closes. And indeed, you find the word repentance in the Arabic language is the word Tawbah. Tawbah comes from the word Awab. Awab means what? Awab means to return. You see, each of these world religions, what do they recognize? They recognize that I, as a human being, I'm on a spiritual journey my whole life, isn't it? As in, as a human being, I'm on a spiritual journey my whole life. I have a spiritual goal. I have a target to reach God. And on this spiritual journey, there are moments, obstacles come on my way, which divert me away from the path of God, isn't it? Each and every one of us, on our spiritual journey towards God, there's been a month or two, a year or two, a decade or two, where we went a bit away from that path. You find that when you recognize there is a need to return back to the path of God, that return is called toba. The idea that you are returning back to the original and ultimate goal. You find every one of the world religions recognizes in any of our journeys, we will face obstacles. The test is after those obstacles, are we ready to change and return? Or are we going to make excuses for those obstacles? And that's why when it comes to this analysis concerning this verse, many emails we receive from around the world are emails related to this topic. You'll find an 18 year old who will email you who say that when I was younger or in my youth currently, I drank alcohol. I was of those who used to drink alcohol without my parents knowing, without the community knowing, but now I want to change. Is God's door for repentance open for me or no? You get a 25 year old who tells you, I was involved in an adulterous relationship which produced a child. I had to abort the child. I regret the abortion every day. Will God forgive me for that act? You find someone in their 30s who may come to you and say, I was involved because of bad friends. I was involved, for example, in an indecent act against a fellow human being where I may have stolen some of their property. Will God forgive me for such an act or no? You'll find someone in their 40s who may mention that I know Islam doesn't allow same gender relations. But in my youth, I was involved in a same gender relation. Or I watched it take place on the internet, for example, or in a video. Does Allah forgive me? In other words, what do we find? We find the most common question many Muslims ask is, is God's door open for repentance or no? As in when I've committed a sin from my young days, will God ever forgive that sin? Because the problem with a sin is what? The problem as a human being is that we actually make a conundrum or an equation out of sin. How many times have you committed a sin and you're like, well, you know, it's only a small one. I've not done the big ones. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib turns it on your head by saying the biggest sin is the one you think is a small one. Ali ibn Abi Talib in one second can turn the human being around, isn't it? The biggest sin is the one you think is a small one. Then you realize, hold on a minute, that means I've got a lot of big sins. Because if I've thought of all the ones I've called small, that means I'm one of the biggest sinners on this earth. Then you find our fourth Imam turns the equation even further. When he says, don't look at the size of the sin, look at who you were disobeying. That you should reach that level, not that I'm thinking only of the sin. Rather, I should reach that level where I think to myself, how could I be so arrogant against the Lord who's so merciful? As in those of you who've been on the day of Arafah, haven't you sat between Dhuhr and Maghrib and thought to yourself, look how merciful this Lord is, that he tells me, if I doubt that I've been forgiven while at Arafah, my Hajj is not complete. Isn't that a merciful Lord? So don't look at the size of the sin, look at who you are disobeying. Therefore, when it comes to the issue of repentance, you find the question always arises, is Allah's door a door open for repentance? Or is it one which closes because of a particular sin? Let's examine this verse because when you understand why this verse was revealed, you may begin from tonight to think that you know what? Maybe I can be forgiven for what I have done. 
And therefore, the examination takes a number of stages. Number one, why was the verse revealed and who was the people involved within the incident? Number two, and of the most important, which other indecent acts similar to the one in this verse can Allah forgive? And would Allah forgive adultery? And would Allah forgive same gender relations if we've acted them? Number three, what does Allah mean even those who are unjust to themselves? What's the difference between the unjust to themselves and the indecent acts? Number four, are we forgiving of the people for us to expect Allah to forgive us? Number five, who were the people? What are the stages of Tawbah according to Amir al-Mu'mineen? Number six, who were the people who became of the Tawabin on the 10th of Muharram? And specifically, which three personalities had a difference with Hussein's father, but ended up loving Hussein himself? Let's examine and dissect the topic in depth. When you come to this verse, as we said, the verse said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذِنُوبِهِمْ When was this verse revealed? Mu'ad bin Jabal narrates, I came to knock at the door of the Prophet one day. When the Prophet opened the door, he looked at me and he said, Mu'ad, why are you crying so much? Mu'ad was crying incessantly. Salamu alaykum, alaykum as -salam. Why are you crying so much? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have this young man with me whose face is a radiant face, who looks like he's a man with piety, or someone with consciousness of God's presence. But this person has performed an act which he says Allah will never forgive him for. And he's crying so much that you'd think he was like a mother who's lost her child. As if a mother loses her child, you can imagine how much that mother would cry when she finds out about the death of her child. He said, Ya Rasulallah, he's crying like a mother who's lost her child. Rasulullah said to the young man, Salamu alaykum, young man. He said, Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. And the young man's crying while he's talking to the Prophet. The Prophet looked at him, he said to him, Young man, why do you cry like this? What's wrong? He said, Ya Rasulullah, if you knew the sin that I had committed, then you would know why I cry. Because Allah will never forgive me for what I've done. And I'm sure the light and the flames of hell await me. Rasulullah looked at him, he said to him, young man, be conscious of Allah. Have you put partners to Allah? Meaning, have you committed shirk? He said, no, glory to Allah. I would never put partners to him. Okay. So have you therefore killed someone? He said, glory to the Lord. I would never kill someone. He said, then if your sin is the size of a mountain, do not worry. Allah will forgive it. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my sin which I committed is greater than the size of the mountain. He said to him, if it's the size of the seas and the deserts and the sands, Allah will forgive. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my sin is greater than the size of the mountain and the sea and the deserts and the sands. He said to him, if your sin is the size of the arsh of Allah in the heavens, Allah will forgive. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my sin is even more greater than all of that. Rasulullah looked at him, he said, young man, do you think Allah would not forgive you? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I don't. I know Allah is forgiving, but for the sin that I've committed, never. He looked at him, he said, young man, explain to me, what is the sin which is worse than shirk, which is worse than murder, which you say you can never be forgiven for? What is the sin? He said to me, Ya Rasulullah, for the last seven years of my life, I have worked in the graveyards. And he said to him that, as you know, we get bodies coming into the graveyard every day. Different bodies from different areas. He said, last week, a body came of one of the women of the Ansar, a young lady. And this young lady of the Ansar, when her body was brought to me, Many of the people had spoken about the beauty of this lady. They had said that this lady's beauty is unrivaled, it's unmatched. So I looked and when everybody was away, I had buried her. Then the whispers of shaitan began to affect me. 
And the whispers of shaitan began to tell me that that body of a beautiful woman is only yours. Nobody else deserves that body. You're the grave digger and nobody else is in the graveyard. Everybody is out. Why don't you go and unravel the shroud and see the mystery that lies behind that woman and her beauty? He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I walked towards the shroud. I had dug up the grave. I removed the shroud and I decided to have a physical moment with the body. Rasulullah looked at him. He said to him, remove yourself from me. Remove. Go away. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, he said, go away. He said, I feel the flames of hell near me. Go away. Don't come near me. Get out. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I swear that when I was with that woman, I swear I could hear a voice saying, Oh man, you are touching me now. Your body will feel the fire of hell while my body will feel the taste of paradise. He said to him, Get out. Get out. Don't stay near me. Leave. As soon as he left, the narration mentions that this man who's committed an act which is arguably the most indecent act. What did the Quran say? وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Fahisha, what's a fahisha? A fahisha is an act of indecency. This is arguably the most indecent act. As in for someone to perform an act like that on a dead body, you can't get more indecent than act. You found that this man, the narration mentioned, he packed his bags. And what he did, he tied his hand to his neck. And he went on top of one of the mountains, and he went towards that mountain and he sat there. The narrations mention that for 40 days and for 40 nights, he remained in a position like this with his hands tied to his neck, crying to Allah day and night with the words, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayhi. Non-stop, istighfar, 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 and crying and istighfar. To the extent one narration mentions that the animals in that area, even they were saddened. As in, you know, sometimes Allah's prophets, when they speak, they speak not just on behalf of the human, even the creations, they speak on their behalf. If you look at Nabi Sulaiman, you find the prophet even saying that even the animals, you find that this person untied his, he put his hand there, 40 days, 40 nights, and was saying astaghfirullah 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 until allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his prophet walladhina idha fa'alu fahishatan aw zalamu anfusahum dhakarallah those who commit an in open indecency or they've been unjust to themselves if they remember allah fastaghfiru li dhunubihim and they ask Allah to forgive them for their sins. May yaghfir al-dunuba illa Allah. True. Who is there to forgive them except Allah? Walam yusru ala ma faalu wa hum yalamun. As long as they don't keep doing the act again and again and again, you found that as soon as this verse was revealed, Rasul Allah had a smile on his face and he said, "How forgiving is this Lord, a Lord who has now revealed to me." that I should go to the mountain and see that man, that young man. Rasulullah went to the young man. The young man was at the mountain. Rasulullah came to him. When Rasulullah came to him, that young man was crying. He didn't stop crying. Ya Allah, how could I be so arrogant to go against your commands? Ya Allah, how can I be so negligent in my duties? The way he was speaking to Allah was of someone who committed an act not out of arrogance, but committed an act out of haste. Rasulullah came to him. When Rasulullah came to him, what did Rasulullah say to him? Rasulullah came to him and said to him, O oh man, rise from your position. O oh companions, come and untie his hands. They untied his hand. The man was in a state where he was virtually bruised. As in there was a state, those hands, he couldn't even move them anymore. And the eye sockets, his eyes had sunk within his sockets. You find that he looked at Rasulullah and he kept on crying. Rasulullah said, Oh man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just revealed the verse in your honor that you have committed a fahisha, an open indecency. But straight away, instead of being arrogant about it, you said, Ya Allah, I regret what I've done. And Ya Allah, it will never be done again. And Ya Allah, I committed out of haste. Allah has now forgiven you for that sin. Notice here, when you look at this verse, what comes out straight away? 
Many people will never commit an act as bad as this, isn't it? As in, I can guarantee that people around the world, it's rare to find people, even if you go to look in the magazines of people who have no education. It's rare to find a case that when someone buries a dead body, they'll go and commit an act with a dead body. Yet even that person who's committed the most disgusting of acts because they sincerely wanted to return back to the path of Allah, Allah opened the doors of mercy for that person. And that's why the Quran, what did it say? The Quran mentions two words here. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Fahisha was what? Fahisha is an open act of indecency. Someone asked the question, the fawahish, is it only this? As in meaning, is it only that if a person has physical relation with a dead body, is that the only meaning of fahisha? No. No, not at all. There are other forms of indecency and there are stories of oh, Allah has forgiven them. Because in this hall today, in this hall, you'll have some people who their physical relationships in their life which they committed when they're younger, they're still uncertain if Allah has forgiven them or no, isn't it? As in not everybody here when they were younger were taught about how you can have a legitimate physical relationship. Remember our mosques, there were certain topics which were taboo, isn't it? You couldn't bring up certain topics. So these youth, when they never heard these topics, what did they end up doing? They ended up committing zina, or they even ended up having same gender relations. Today, in the Muslim world, there are youth who say we committed acts of zina, either with the opposite gender or with the same gender when we were younger. How do we know if we've been forgiven? As in maybe someone at the age of 18 committed zina and got married at 23. That person every day, do you know what the problem is with zina? It sticks to your soul. Every day when you wake up, you're thinking, have I been forgiven? And it sticks, it keeps reminding you, you did it a day ago, you did it a week ago, last year, 10 years, 15, you'll never forget it. You can't forget it. It stays with you. The picture remains clear. So someone then asked the question, have I been forgiven for that act? You see, mate, you have two types of people in relation to this question. The first type say, I had to go through that for me to be religious. How arrogant. So what do you mean you had to go through that? You know, everybody has to taste and touch and try, and then you know what is right and wrong. Yes, <laughs> mashallah. If it's that easy, let's all do that. If it's that easy, everyone has to taste and try and touch. Then what's the point of religion? You're going to make up your own mind what you want to practice. You find the first group of people are those who say, I'm sorry, I had to do it. It was part of my youth. And would you believe there are parents who tell them this as well? There are parents who when you tell them, make your son religious or your daughter religious at a young age. So you want him to be a mullah from this age? So what do you mean you want him to be a mullah? They say, come on, let the boy enjoy himself. You're giving him all these strict laws, all these strict rules. You find that that first type of person is the arrogant. They don't even care if Allah has forgiven them or no. Imam then says, but then there's a second type of person who regrets that act. They wish they had never performed it. And Al Muhammad show us any of the fawahish, adultery with the same gender or with the opposite gender can be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone says, are you telling me now if there is someone who has an adulterous relationship with someone of the same gender, you're telling me Allah forgives this act? Because we know Islam does not allow homosexuality. Islam forbids homosexuality. So someone turns around and says, well, what if some Muslim took part in an act of homosexuality? That Muslim, will they be forgiven or no? Yes, they'll be forgiven. What do you mean they'll be forgiven? They have to be punished? No, on the contrary. If a person commits an act and then they want to ask for forgiveness, Allah's doors of Rahmah are always open as long as the person doesn't keep repeating the act. You see, there are some people, what do they do? Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu The next week he's doing the same act. No. The idea is, وَلَمْ يُصِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا person came to Ali bin Abi Talib salawatu Allah wa salamu alayhi. He said to him, Ya Amir al muminin punish me. He said to him, why? He said, I was involved in a sexual act with someone of the same gender. Ali bin Abi Talib said, leave me, please, leave me. Go. This is an act which requires witnesses. Go, go somewhere else. He came back the next day. He said, Ya Amir al muminin punish me, punish me. He said, young man, leave. Person came the next day, Ya Amir al muminin punish me. 
I've performed this act and I'm admitting it to you. I'm admitting. I've performed this act. And I'd rather be punished in this world than feel the flames of the hereafter. <laughs> Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at him and he said to him, young man, you performed this act? He said, yes, you, I've performed it. And I've only come to you to ask for you to punish me. He said to him, why? He said, because I don't see justice in any human like Ali ibn Abi Talib. I know if Ali ibn Abi Talib performs an act, he's doing it for God, not doing it for the people. I performed an act and I'm sincerely sorry about the performance of this act. Imam Amir al muminin looked at him because obviously homosexuality is seen as one of the fawahish. It's seen as an act of indecency. The Quran had already told Ali ibn Abi Talib, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ And then what? فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذِنُوبِهِمْ If these people who've committed fahisha remember Allah and they are asking for forgiveness, مَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذِّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who's going to forgive the sins except Allah? Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at him. He said to him, which punishment do you want? He said, give me the worst punishment. I want to feel the worst so I don't feel it in the hereafter. But truly, O son of Abu Talib, I am so sorry about what I've done. I was wrong. I was hasty. I was in the wrong group of people. I will never perform the act again. And I swear to you, day after day after day, the act burns me in my heart. Amir al-Mu'min said to him, young man, you are forgiven. O son of Abu Talib, what do you mean you're forgiven? Punish him. No, no, no. If a person performs an act, but when he comes to that ma'soom, remember, Islamic punishment can only be under ma'soom. Not every Tom, Dick and Harry can come and punish a human being. Should be a ma'soom who leads a state. Someone says, why a ma'soom? Because a ma'soom obviously has knowledge of the seen and the unseen. A normal human being may end up doing oppression to another human, isn't it? A ma'soom is the only one. You find Ali ibn Abi Talib, what do you say? The Muslims were saying, kill him, burn him. No, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, wait. If this person is saying, I am wrong, I am sorry, then the door of repentance is open, isn't it? Today, how many Muslims do you ever hear saying the door of Tawbah should be open? On the contrary, many Muslims today have reached that level, punish, kill, remove. No, on the contrary, Amir al muminin said to the person, oh man, will you repeat this act again? He said, I swear I will never repeat the act again. Oh man, do you regret what you've done? I swear I regret. And that's why how many times do you read in the Quran before any punishment, like the cutting of the hands of the thief, or adultery, or homosexuality, it always says, but forgiveness is better, isn't it? If you ask for forgiveness, that's better. Even Ayatollah al-Khumayni, may Allah bless his soul, you find that even when he was heading the Islamic State, some of the scholars who were around him were discussing with him. They were saying to him that there are certain Islamic laws. Don't you think there should be forgiveness applied to some of these laws? As in, instead of punishment straight away, don't you think the door of Tawbah should be open for some of these people? So what do you find? You find he had committed a fahisha by being with the dead body. Ali ibn Abi Talib saw someone who committed a fahisha. Who, which fahisha? Homosexuality. Again, he forgave him. Even the fahisha of zina, adultery. If a woman commits zina today, You'll find many Muslims turning around, even the Western media will turn around and say, Islam, as soon as they find out about the lady committing adultery, they want to kill her straight away. On the contrary, Islam says if that lady is sincerely repentant about what she'd done, then possibly the doors of Tawbah should be open on the base of the Quran. Someone says, but it's of the Fawahish. Yes, even if it's of the Fawahish, someone commits a Fawahisha, the door of Tawbah should be open. A lady was brought to Umar ibn al-Khattab. When she was brought to Umar ibn al-Khattab, they said to her, Oh Khalifa, this lady has committed zina with one of the men. And we have the witnesses. How many witnesses do you need for adultery? Four, isn't it? Four who see the same act at the same time and they repeat it in the same way. Only Allah knows how this happens, honestly. So there's four people who are watching the act take place. All of them are watching it and these people are acting. Only Allah knows where this, you know, it's, it's not meant to be a law which is looking to catch people. Today it's become a law. Let's put cameras, let's put spy. That's in their home. Leave it. It's the privacy of their house. You find that Ali ibn Abi Talib was there. Omar al-Khattab, they brought the lady. Omar said, kill her. Ali ibn Abi Talib, she, she looked at Omar. She said, do you mind before you kill me? Do you mind asking Ali ibn Abi Talib what he thinks of what I've done? He said, no problem. Amir al-Mu'mineen was there. He said, oh Ali, 
she has committed adultery, the punishment is that she has to be killed. We have the witnesses. Ali bin Abi Talib said, wait, wait. He said to a young lady, why did you commit adultery? She said, oh, son of Abu Talib, we were in a state of hunger. We have absolutely no food, nothing to eat. And I've got children. What do you want me to do? As in, I've got children. I've gone to beg from the people. Nobody gives me anything. I've gone to ask the people. Nobody gives me. Until there is this man who has so much money. I asked him. He said to me, no. Only if you commit an act with me. I said to him, please, have respect for yourself. These are my kids. No, only if you commit an act of adultery. No, only if you commit an act. She said, I committed the act for the sake of my children. Ali ibn Abi said, let her go. Omar ibn al-Khattab turned around and said, what are you doing? Why are you letting her go? She committed adultery. He said, Surah 5, verse 3 of the Quran. He said to him, what does it say? He says, those who are compelled to sin while they are in a state of hunger, Allah forgives them for what they have done. Clear, the Quran is clear. Those who are compelled to sin while in a state of hunger, even an act like zina, an act like homosexuality, an act like that person with the dead body, Allah showed my door of Tawbah never closes. Never have an excuse in your life. Allah will never forgive me. Allah will never help me. Your Lord has shown you acts which you can never come near. And he's opened the door of Tawbah. How dare you close the door which Allah has never closed. Isn't it? You find therefore that the Quran said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Then the Quran made another point. أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ All those who have been unjust to themselves. Sometimes a person may commit a major act of indecency. Sometimes, no, a person may commit an act, but the moment someone explains to them properly about why this act is not allowed, you'll find they'll change straight away. Brothers and sisters, I could easily say to someone, this act, if you do it, hell awaits you. Hell will burn you. Hell will kill you. That person's not going to change, is he? That person will say, take your hell and go somewhere else. If, however, I explain the philosophy of the reason why it's not allowed, wouldn't that person say, you know what, I have been a violin to my nafs. The way you've explained it has now made me understand why it's a sin, isn't it? Al-Fahisha, everybody knows it's a sin. Valamu and Fusawam sometimes is what? Is that I have to be explained why? When a moment I'm explained, maybe that person will change. You find today in our communities, do you think someone who's sinful, if all I do is tell him, you're going to burn in hell, hell awaits you, you're going to die there, that person won't change. If however I say, brother, come and listen why this isn't allowed. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far in that famous story, he explains this beautifully. He's walking past the house, and when he walks past the house, he hears music being played in that house. When he hears music being played in the house, he sees a lady sweeping the floor outside the house. Imam looks at her and he says to her, Oh lady, may I ask you a question? She said, yes. He said, is the owner of a house a free man or a slave? She said, oh, he's definitely a free man. Definitely. He said, yes. If he was a slave, he'd recognize the master that's watching him listen to the music. She looked at him. She said, that's not a normal answer. As she walked back in, the man who owns the house looked at her and said, I heard you talking to someone. Who are you talking to? She said, oh, I was just talking to someone who walked past. He said, what did you say to him? She said, he asked me the strangest question. He said to me, is the owner of, a house, of the house a free man or a slave? Because he heard the music being played in the house. So the man said, what did you say to him? She said, I said to him, the owner is definitely a free man. He said, so what did he say to you? She said, he gave me the strangest reply. He said, yes, because if he was a slave, he'd think about the master that's watching him. That man asked her, how does he look like? She said, he has the following complexion and he has the following height. He was barefooted. He hadn't worn his slippers. He ran outside his house barefooted. He said, where is Musa ibn Ja'far? It's as if he knew Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, how he looks like. He came to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he said, Oh, Imam, I beg you ask Allah to forgive me. He said, what do you mean? He said, music was never explained to me like this before. Before, when they told me, don't listen to music, they would say, music is not allowed. But now I realized, 
How can I claim to be a servant of Allah when I'm willing to disobey Allah right under him? You see that explanation? That person, what's happened to him? Quran said, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Oh, ظلموا أنفسهم. There are some people, the way they understand is what? There are some people, they'll look at an act of theirs, they'll be like, Ya Allah, I'm so sorry. Only now, through explanation, I understand. Only now I understand why I've committed a sin. Therefore, what did you find? The Quran came forward and said, any act, fahisha, or ظلم to the nafs, Allah is willing to forgive. And that's why the next question arises, are we forgiving of God's creation? for us to be forgiven by Allah because you'll find many who will come on nights like this many of them will say Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu alayh Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu alayh Ya Allah look after me Ya Allah I want to come back on your path you say excuse me are you willing to forgive Allah's creation or no as in do you have anyone you haven't forgiven yes I have people I still haven't forgiven then why should you be forgiven by the creator when you can't forgive his creation Today in the mosque, in this majlis, we have certain people who may say, Ya Allah, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Whereas when their fellow creation says, please forgive me for this act, they're not willing to forgive, isn't it? How many of us, how many of us have people in our families or friends or in our communities who committed a wrong act against us? They've come, they've said, please forgive me. Please, I'm so sorry about what I've done. And we're like, never. That person, I'll never forgive them. Then the next minute we're like, Ya Allah, I beg you forgive me. How dare you be rude to the creation and then expect mercy from the creator, isn't it? How many times have you seen in Salat al-Layl, when you come and you raise your hands in Salat al-Layl, you find Allah does something to you spiritual. Do you know what it is? You raise your hands in Salat al-Layl and you, you know you have to ask for forgiveness for 40 people, isn't it? How many times in those 40 does the name of someone who you don't like come in your head? You are like, Ya Allah, him, him. No way, not her, never. <laughs> Do you know why Allah puts that test there? He's trying to show you, you know what? Spiritually, you're still low. You're not what I want. You follow 14 personalities who forgave my creation for everything they did to them. And you can't forgive my creation? Then do not expect me to have mercy on you when you don't have mercy on my creation. Malik al-Ashtar one day is walking home. He walks through the market. A person sees him walking through the market. Do you know what that person does? person can't see who it is because Malik al-Ashtar wears a shawl around his head, covers himself. As he's walking, the person sees him. And the person has finished work that day, all the date stones are left. Malik is walking, that person, what does he do? He's like, guys, watch this. He picks up the date stones and throws them all on Malik. None of his friends are laughing. He's the only one laughing. No one else is laughing. He's like to them, why aren't you laughing? He said, you know who you just threw date stones at or no? He's like, no, just some old man walking. They said to him, Malik al-Ashtar, second in command of Ali ibn Abi Talib's armed forces. You know this guy when his face becomes blue. You know the face when it becomes blue? You know that I've just thrown at the most powerful general in the whole of Arabia. He ran looking for Malik. Where's Malik? Nobody knows. Where's Malik? Nobody knows. Until he entered the mosque, he saw Malik there within the mosque. When he saw Malik there within the mosque, as soon as he saw him, he saw Malik praying. He waited for Malik to finish his salah. As soon as Malik finished his salah, he sat near him. He said to him, oh Malik, I beg you forgive me for throwing those date stones at you. Do you know Malik's reply is the meaning of this whole concept. Malik said to him, do not worry. I came to the mosque to pray to Ruk'ah for Allah to forgive you for what you've done. See that level? That level that I'm willing to forgive God's creation. Who am I? I, on the day of judgment, I'm going to debase myself so low, saying, please forgive me. How dare I tell his creation that you can't be forgiven when my Lord himself never closed the doors on his creation, isn't it? Has Allah ever closed his doors? A guy sleeps with someone from a grave, another of the same gender, another of the opposite gender, and Allah still forgives them. How dare I then be rude 
to his creation by not being willing to forgive them. And that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen says that when you come to say Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh, it has a number of conditions because someone can easily leave the mosque tonight and say Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh, I am sorry about what I did when I was younger. Uh, it won't happen again, we'll move on. No. Ali ibn Abi Talib once heard someone say Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. As soon as he heard him, he said, Woe be to you, O oh man. Do you know what uh, is the meaning of Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh? The man said, I don't know. Amir al-Mu'mineen, tell me. He said, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh has a number of stages before your tawbah is accepted. The man said, what are the stages? He said, stage number one, regretting that sin that you performed. Don't walk around saying, I had to go through those days. No. Stage number one is that you regret that sin. Imam 60 Imam says, half of tawbah is regret. Half of tawbah is regret. That you say, Ya Allah, forgive me for those days. That's number one. Number two, the second stage, never ever commit the act again. Not I have a sin which I said I'm going to stop and then two weeks later I'm back doing the sin again, isn't it? Muharram, Safar, everyone's religious. Safar finishes, we're all back to everything again, isn't it? You find that number two, I will never do the act again. Number three, any money I earned from that act, I give back to its owners. If not its owners, I give back to charity. Number four, I will make sure all my obligatory duties are performed in the best of ways. Number five, the years I wasn't religious, I make them up with years of being religious. If I wasn't religious for 10 years, I make them up with 10 years of religiosity. On the contrary, I should make them up until the day I die, isn't it? But I make up those years, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, only after those stages, will your tawbah finally have been accepted? And that's why, brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to ask ourselves that we need to, have we performed the tawbah as quick as possible? Or are we still slow in our tawbah? As in sometimes in our communities today, you'll find somebody will say, I'll perform tawbah after I get married, then I'll go to hajj, and then I'll perform tawbah. Isn't it? There'll be people who say, I'll come back to Allah after marriage and after hajj. Then there are others who need to ask themselves, is the way I'm living my life now, would the Imam of my time be happy with me? Or do I need to perform tawbah? What do I mean? I mean, look at yourself in the mirror tonight. Ask yourself if your Imam saw you tonight, would he be happy with the way you live your life? Would he be saying that this is truly a follower of Al Muhammad, an honorable person or not? If not, then go into your shower and perform ghusl tawbah Perform the ghusl of tawbah. There's a ghusl, there's a shower for tawbah, which means I've got a new start, O oh Imam. I am the one who says, Allahumma kunni waliyika al hujjat ibn al hasan I am the one who says, Assalamu alayka ya sahib al asr wa zaman But if that Imam saw the way I behave, will he be proud of me or do I need to return back to him? Sheikh Baha'u'd-Din, one of the great scholars of Qum, narrates how a man used to take a caravan for Hajj and a caravan to Mashhad. They used to take a caravan to Mashhad. You know, in those days, there was no cars. You take a caravan to Mashhad. This head of the caravan, what did he do? The head of the caravan saw Imam al-Rada in his dream. Please listen to this very important story. He said, I saw Imam al-Rada in my dream saying to me, bring with you Ibrahim the thief. He said, I thought maybe this dream, it didn't make any sense. Imam al-Rada would never ask, bring someone who's a thief to my ziyarah. Second day, in the same dream, Imam al-Rada saying to me, bring Ibrahim the thief with you. Third day, Imam al-Rada saying, you came to my ziyarah in Mashhad. Why did you not bring Ibrahim the thief with you? This person said, forget it. Where's this Ibrahim the thief? Let me go and find him. He saw Ibrahim said, Ibrahim, we were both boyhood friends. Ibrahim, come here. Ibrahim, come with me, Mashhad. He said, where? You know that where when you're not religious. When someone tells you, come Ziara, where? Ziara? Habibi, tell me Dubai, tell me Vegas, tell me, this guy's telling me Ziyarah. Where? He said, Mashhad. He said, what do you mean Mashhad? Come with me, Mashhad? Mashhad? No way. 
I'm never going to go and face Imam al Rada like that. He said, I beg you, come with me, Mashhad. Please, you don't understand. He said, no, no, no. I'm not going to Mashhad. I'm not ready to become religious. I'm not ready to become religious. Because I know if I go there, I have to change. Like the one who says, I don't want to go to Hajj because I'm going to shave my head. I beg you, come with me, Mashhad. He said, okay, very well. I'm coming with you, Mashhad, but don't tell anyone in the group about me or anything. I'm going to jump in the caravan and we move. On the way, when he's taken the caravan to Mashhad, on the way, some highway thieves have attacked the caravan. They've collected the money from everyone, put it in a pouch and jumped off. And they've moved away. Everyone's distraught. Everyone's sad. Everyone's sorry. And the driver of that small bus that was there at the time, he said to him, he said, you know what? I'm really sad because now I have no money. They've taken the Zawar's money. I have no money to put gasoline in. And the head of the caravan was sad and Ibrahim the thief came out. He said, how much money do you guys need? So they were like, what do you mean? He's like, when he stole all of your money and he put it in the pouch, as he's leaving, I stole his pouch and put it inside my pocket. <laughs> now listen to the crunch moment. Please listen to this. The head of the caravan turned around and said, No wonder Imam al Rada told me to bring you, O Ibrahim the thief. Ibrahim said to him, What? He said, No wonder Imam al Rada told me bring Ibrahim the thief. Ibrahim began to cry. He said, Imam al Rada sees me as a thief. Is that how my Imam sees me? He said to him, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, need, I want, didn't want to offend you, but Imam al-Rabba said, bring Ibrahim the thief. He said, so Imam al-Rabba had no other title for me but the thief. Then tie me to the shrine of Ali ibn Musa. Allow me to be forgiven. Because how dare I claim to love al-Muhammad and al-Muhammad may see me as the worst creation. How many of you in front of Al Muhammad's last son may be seen by him in a low way? Have you ever reflected on the fact that the 12th of Al Muhammad may look at you in a way where he's not proud, may look at you in a way where he says, we gave all of our lives away and this is what you give back to us. Tawbah should be an act performed at any time. Because however bad you are, or however good you are, there has to be that return back to the path of Allah because the path of Allah never closes. And that's why on the 10th of Muharram, that path of Tawbah was never closed. Because on the army of Imam al Hussein and the opposition army, there were certain people who on the 10th of Muharram, the path of their Tawbah could have easily closed, isn't it? But Abba Abdullah had a motto, I'll forgive the creation in order that I'm forgiven by the Creator. And you found from the opposition, there are narrations which tell us 30 people from the opposition came towards Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. How many? 30. Imam al Hussein never once said to any of them, I'm sorry, I don't forgive you. I'm sorry you blocked the water from me. I'm sorry you've left my daughters thirsty and my baby moaning. He never said to any of them that you people are not welcome on our side. No, Abba Abdullah's heart was a lovely heart, a soft heart, a heart which every Muslim has to have. Who converted on the 10th of Muharram? Who performed Tawbah? The first who performed Tawbah were two of the staunchest enemies of Ali bin Abi Talib. I tell you, would you forgive people who were enemies of your dad? It's not easy. But two of them, Sa'ad al-Ansari, and Abu al-Hutuf al-Ansari. They were two brothers. They fought Ali ibn Abi Talib in the Battle of Nahrawan. 20 odd years before Karbala, they had fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. You found on the 10th of Muharram. Do you know what hurt them? They saw Sayyidah Zainab walking from tent to tent. It broke their heart. And they came towards the army of Imam al Hussein. They came to Abba Abdullah. They said, Ya Abba Abdullah, we beg you to forgive us. We know that we are the ones who've been in Omar ibn Sa'ad's army, but now we recognize we are wrong. We want to perform Tawbah. We want to come back towards your path. Abba Abdullah, I beg you, forgive us. 
those two were forgiven. Then the second person who performed Tawbah on the 10th of Muharram, Zuhair ibn Al-Qayn. Zuhair ibn Al-Qayn was a supporter of Uthman against Imam Ali. And Imam al Hussein on his way to Karbala, Imam al Hussein on his way, Zuhair ibn al Qayn was in the tent with his wife, Daylam. Sit that child down, I beg of you. Sit the child down, this one here. Sit him down. He's walked across without anyone sitting him down. Zuhair ibn al Qayn was with his wife Daylam, they were walking. They were coming from Hajj, Imam al Hussein was coming from Mecca as well. Imam al Hussein was in a tent, Zuhair was in another tent. Daylam was sitting with Zuhair. While Daylam was sitting with Zuhair, Zuhair kept on looking at her and saying, I hope he doesn't send a messenger to me. Because I know that he's right and Yazid is wrong. I hope he doesn't send anyone to me. Daylam looked at him when the messenger came. She said, oh my husband Zuhair, you are sitting with me when the son of Fatima al-Zahra is alone. Zuhair, go to Hussein ibn Ali, go and sit by him, go and sit near him. The narrations mention Zuhair ibn al Qayn walked with his head down to Aba Abdullah. He sat by Aba Abdullah and he begged Aba Abdullah for forgiveness that he wasn't with him. Aba Abdullah with his open heart, he said, Zuhair, you're more than welcome. Please come and join us. And I tell you, there's only one person when he died on the 10th of Muharram, Aba Abdullah said something which he never said for anyone else. When Zuhair ibn al Qayn fell on the ground on the 10th of Muharram, they began to hit his body with their swords. They began to kill him and they began to rip his body into pieces. Aba Abdullah said, Ya Allah, raise them as pigs on the day of judgment, not as humans. Because what they've done to Zuhair ibn al Qayn is not right. Zuhair ibn al Qayn, do you know, they mutilated his body when he lay on the ground in the tenth of Muharram. And he's the one who, when they asked him, Are you ready to die for Aba Abdullah? Do you know what he said? He said, Wallah, if you cut my body into a thousand pieces and you brought me back alive a thousand times, each time I would be in honor of dying for Aba Abdullah. Therefore, you found the second one was who? Zuhair ibn al Qayn with his body on the ground. Then the third one is the one which hurts the most. Who is it? The third one is the most famous one who changed. Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi. Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi was the chief of Banu Riyah. The chief of Banu Riyah. The chief of Umar bin Sa'ad's army. They used to say if you asked for the bravest warrior of Kufa, it's Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi. And this Hur, his heart was so pure. Wallah, his heart. And when a heart is pure, you think Abu Abdullah's heart is impure? You found this Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi when he met Imam al Hussein at Karbala. His soldiers were thirsty. When he saw his soldiers thirsty, Hur, what did he do? He came to Abu Abdullah. He said, Ya Abu Abdullah, do you mind giving us some water? Our soldiers are thirsty. This was a week before Ashura. Our soldiers are thirsty. Can you give us some water? Imam al Hussein said, Oh, Hur, of course I'll give you water. Do not worry. Here is water for your soldiers, and even here is water for your horses. Because I can't bear to see a horse thirsty. Hur looked at him and he said, I thank you very much. Then it came for the time of Salah. Aba Abdullah said, Hur, why don't you lead us in Salah? Hur said, how can I lead ahead of the son of Fatima to Zahra? Oh, Aba Abdullah, you lead us. You're better than all of us. Hur didn't know they planned to kill Imam al Hussein. Hur was given a command, block them, let them agree to give allegiance to the Khalifa. When they agree, send them back. Never once did he hear anyone tell him, kill Imam al Hussein. All he heard was, pledge allegiance to, Hus uh, to Yazid. When the pledge is given, move on. Then you found that when it came towards Imam al Hussein wanting to head to the people of Kufa, you find Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi blocked water from Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein could now not reach the water. Imam al Hussein say, may, said to him, May your mom have lost you, O Hur. He looked at him and he said, <laughs> He looked at him and he said to him, Wallah, if it had been the son of any other mother, I would have cursed your mom. But how can I be rude to your mother? He looked at him and he said, don't say these things to me. Leave me. I've only come here to get the pledge of allegiance from you. 
you know, Har, he went back where? He went back to his tent. Imam al Hussein went back to his tent. They were difficult moments for Har now because he knew he knew he was in a predicament between right and wrong, between good and evil, between heaven and hell. A decision each one of us will go through in our life. The quicker we get to it, the better for us. Har sat down, and when he sat down on the tenth of Muharram, he could hear Sukaina shouting, Al Atash, Al Atash, the thirst, the thirst is killing us. And he hears Imam al Hussein calling out, Hal min nasirin yansuruna. Is there anyone to help us? Now he felt hurt and he sat down. Omar bin Sa'ad on one side, Shimr bin Jindil Joshan on the other. He sat down on the 10th of Muharram in the morning. Three things made him change on that morning. The first thing he heard Omar bin Sa'ad. He said to Omar bin Sa'ad, what is going to happen this morning, O Omar bin Sa'ad? He said, do you want to know what's going to happen? Heads will fly and hands will be severed this morning. He couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. This was the first time that he had come across this. Then he saw Shimr bin al Joshan when Imam al Hussein had put some fire in front of his tent to protect himself. Shimr looked at Imam al Hussein and he said to Imam al Hussein, Oh Hussein, are you getting yourself ready for the fire of hell? Again, Hur was hurt even more. But the third thing was the moment that he changed. And wouldn't you change on this moment? He heard Omar bin Sa'ad complaining. He wondered what's Omar bin Sa'ad complaining about. When he got near Omar bin Sa'ad, he heard him saying, Get some water for the hooves of my horses. My horses can't take the heat of Karbala. Your horses can't take the heat of Karbala. How about the daughters of Rasulullah? Hur, when he heard this, he sat down. Muhajir came to him. He said to him, Hur, if someone said to me, who's the greatest warrior in Kufa? I'd say it's you. But I look at your face. You seem like you're uncertain. He said, Muhajir, at every point you have to make a decision between heaven and hell. And this is my moment now. I have to make this decision. He turned around towards his son by the name of Ali. He turned around to his brother by the name of Mus'ab. He turned around to his servant. He said, let's go to the master, Abba Abdullah. He began to walk towards Imam al Hussein, full of anger inside him for being deceived by his own soldiers. He began to walk towards the Imam. He looked towards his servant and he said to his servant, I beg you, cover my face when I come near Abba his servant looked at him and he said to him, oh my master, why? He said, I'm ashamed to look at Abu Abdullah. I am the one who blocked the water from reaching the children of Abu Abdullah. And I am the one who has left him alone with no one to protect him. He came towards Abu Abdullah. He had covered his face. He was embarrassed to look at him. When he came towards Abu Abdullah, the narrations mentioned to us. Abu Fadl al Abbas saw him. He came out to try and attack him. Abu Abdullah said, Wait, wait, let's see what he's got to say. When he came near Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah said to him, Look at me in my eyes. Tell me, what is it? He said, Abu Abdullah, forgive me for being the man who blocked the water from reaching you. Abu Abdullah, I didn't know that they wanted to kill you. Abu Abdullah, I beg you for one thing. Listen to what he asked him. He said to him, I beg you, go to Sayyid Zainab and say to her, I'm sorry for making her a prisoner today. He looked at Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah, look at the sweetness of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein looked at him, he said, Hold, do not worry, do not worry, I forgive you. He then looked at Abu Abdullah, he said to him, Ya Abu Abdullah, considering I blocked you, let me be the first to die for you. Abu Abdullah said, you don't have to. He said, no, no, please, it would be my honor. He went back. The narrations mentioned that he fought until he was eventually killed. When Imam al Hussein came to his body, Hur looked at him. He said, Assalamu alaikum, ya Abu Abdullah. 
Hard look to see him, Imam said, do not worry, Hora. You are like your mother named you. Free in this world and free in the hereafter. Hora was on the ground. Zuhair bin Qayn was on the ground on the night of the 11th of Muharram. Both of their bodies were lying on the ground. Zuhair bin Qayn, his wife, Daylam, she had a servant. She said to the servant, go and look for my husband's body. My husband, they mutilated his body. Here's a piece of cloth. I want you to take the cloth. I want you to go. I want you to cover my husband's body. That servant went out looking in the middle of the battlefield. That servant came back to Dalem. Dalem looked at that servant. She said to the servant, did you cover my husband's body? The servant said no. Dalem said why? She said as I was about to cover the body of Zuhair, I saw the body of Imam al Hussein alone on the ground. I saw Abu Abdullah with no one to cover his body. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Raise your hands, brothers and sisters. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad to allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman. Allow us on a night like this to perform a sincere repentance and allow us to be amongst those who receive the intercession of our Imam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a surah al-Fatiha but before it the loudest of your salawat. Lovers of the holy house so now acclaim emulating their example our aim. Lovers of the holy house so now acclaim Emulating their example, our aim Living like Ali and struggling like Hussein Is the key if paradise we wish to gain See the pain, see the pain See the pain, see the pain